Okay, this is part two of my lecture series on Minase Sangin Hyakuin, Three Poets at Minase, composed in 1488 by Sogi, Socho, and Shohaku. And I have the link to the study guide in the description. You want to follow along the study with the study guide as I explain things. Okay, so I'm going to start very broadly and generally and slowly narrow into the work itself. All right, and I've already made part one of this series. Um, you, some of you have already watched that. Ideally, you will want to watch this one before you watch the next one, but it doesn't really matter which order you watch it in. All right, starting with the, uh, at the top of the study guide, we have the sources. First, we have the uh, original version that I use is Minase Sangin Hyakuin. It's in the Nihon Koten Bungaku Taike number 39, the Rengashu uh, volume. Um, I have the information out there, and for the English translation, I have used Stephen Carter's translation and notes that he has included in his traditional Japanese poetry and anthology, which is an amazing uh, piece of scholarship and translations. Uh, if you're interested in the subject, I definitely recommend that book. And then I have a further reading list of all the sources that you might find helpful for those of you that want to delve further into the subject. I found these Sources most helpful, Barnhill's essay on Renga. Earl Miner, of course, was sort of the, er, one of the early scholars of Renga in the 1970s and 80s. And a lot of his stuff has been challenged in recent years, but he sort of laid the foundation for scholarship on Renga, linked poetry in the Anglo sphere. Uh, Haruo Shirane, more recently, has his books on Matsuo Basho. And uh, the Four Seasons this is his more recent book that uh, talks about Denga. And uh, more recently, Herbert Johnson's Reading Japanese Haikai Poetry, a study in the polyphony, poly polyphony of Yosa Busson's linked poems, also discusses Denga at great length. Okay. So now on to the uh, Minase Sangin Hyakuin Denga session. Okay, so what is going on with this session? Uh, these three poets gathered at the Minase Jingu, a Shinto shrine located between present-day Kyoto and Osaka on the 20, 250th anniversary of uh, Emperor Gotoba's death. And they met in order to console the spirit of the Denga composing emperor. So the emperor was one of the early uh, sort of fans of Denga poetry and he did much to advance its cause. And the three poets who are committed to Denga gather and compose this uh, work in memory of him. Okay, the shrine itself the Minase Jingu Shrine, located between Kyoto and Osaka, is dedicated to the emperor, to the retired emperor Gotoba, who lived from 1180 to 1239 and reigned uh, basically through the 1180s and 1190s. And he's the 82nd emperor, according to the traditional counting um, system of counting the emperors. He was exiled to Oki Islands with his two sons following the Jokyu War, the Jokyu Norang of 1221. He had a detached palace in Minase, right, that he often visited, and that is where he composed many of his Nenga and Waka poems. The shrine inside <coughs> the, uh, the shrine itself contains a hall named after retired Emperor Gotoba that houses a sacred image of him, and I'm thinking about taking my seminar students to this shrine for our next uh, Zemi Ryoko, Zemi uh, journey. Um, the emperor was a fan of Waka and Nenga. He often composed poems at his Minase palace. Uh, he also led the editing of the Shinkokinshu. So he's very, a very important figure in the world of uh, classical Japanese poetry. The Shinkokinshu, of course, I'll explain that a little bit more later, but it's one of the major anthologies of classical Waka and um, translated as a new collection of poems, ancient and modern. The first imperially sanctioned anthology, of course, is the Kokinshu. This is the Shin Kokinshu. I'll explain more about that below. Um, the emperor's favorite, famous waka, composed at Minase, is alluded to in the first stanza of the Minase Denga uh, sequence that we're reading today. And in that waka, he challenges the established view that autumn evenings are superior to evenings in other seasons. Okay, and... I will start. I will read his waka composed um, at Minase. And it's a very famous uh, waka, and Sogi refers to it in the first stanza of the hundred verse sequence. Miwa taseba yamamoto kasumu 
みなせがわゆうべはあきと何思いもいけむ And Keen, Donald Keen translates that as When I gaze far off, the mountain slopes are misty, Minase River. Why did I ever suppose evenings are best in autumn? Okay, so the work we're reading today begins with a sort of tribute to that famous waka composed、uh, nearly five centuries earlier, four centuries, three centuries earlier.、Um, all right, standard form of traditional denga. Okay, the next. Section on your study guide is about Hyakuin Denga, this genre called the Hyakuin Denga, or 100 verse Denga. So, what is this genre? It's the standard form of traditional Denga. Okay, you remember we've already talked about Kaseng, which comes、uh, on the scene later with Maso Basho and so forth, which is a 32 sequence Denga. This is a 100 sequence, a 100 stanza sequence Denga. And it use, uses mostly uta kotoba. This is a key word, underline that in your study guide. Uta kotoba, what does it mean? Standard poetic diction established in the Kokinshu. So the Kokinshu, the first imperial anthology, sort of set the、uh, words that could be used in、uh, waka, right? And poets would conform to those rules about what, what words could be used. And denga, the Hyakuin denga form, in general, Conforms to those rules about、uh, which words you can use and which words you can't use.、Uh, during the rule of Emperor Gotoba, Gotoba, I should say,、um, and the, during the compilation, the editing of the Shin Kokin Wakashu, Denga developed enough to form its own school independent from Waka. Okay, so first we have Waka in the beginning.、Uh, originally we have Kanshi, but then Waka, the Japanese native. Form of poetry displaces kanshi in the Heian period. And then the next stage of traditional Japanese verse is denga. So waka morphs into denga, denga eventually morphs into haikai denga, and that eventually morphs into kyoka, which we might discuss at some further point. But for now, we're focusing on the second stage in traditional native Japanese poetry, namely denga. All right. So in, in the、uh, court of the Heian period, Uh, Ushin Mushin Denga sessions in,、uh, in the court. Okay, wait. In the court, the imperial court, we have、uh, sessions that were held. And these were Ushin Mushin Denga sessions. I will explain these two words below. Underline them for now. Ushin and Mushin Denga sessions. In these sessions, poets and non poets would divide into two groups the Ushin group and the Mushin group. Then they would alternately link stanzas. So, one, somebody from the Ushin side would write a stanza, and the next person from the Mushin side would write the following stanza. The Ushin group would offer orthodox, elegant stanzas, right? Ushin. The Mushin side would offer comical or wild or、uh, stanzas that are full of wordplay. And this practice ended with the Jokyu War of 1221. However, it served as an important foundation for later Hyakuin Denga, which placed more emphasis on the skill of the poets, so more emphasis on the Mushin side.、Uh, I'll explain more about Ushin and Mushin later. Stanzas by many major Denga participants of the Gotoba courts, such as Fujiwara no Teika, who's, one, who's sort of the major poet of the Shin Kokin Wakashio,、uh, stanzas by these poets were later anthologized in the first imperial Denga anthology. Tsukubashu. Okay, Tsukubashu. The Tsukuba Anthology, compiled in 1356. This is the first major work of Denga、uh, Anthology. Okay, so underline that, take note of that. Okay, on now to the three participants of this work that we're reading today, the Minase session. Okay, who are the three poets? Sogi, Socho, and Shohaku. Sogi is the leader of the group, okay? So he starts the. He's, he writes the first stanza of the 100th. Stanzas. All right, born in 1421, died in 1502. So he lived through most of the 15th century. He's a Buddhist monk. This is very important. And he's Japan's greatest medieval denga poet. So when you talk about denga, his name almost invariably comes up. Almost invariably comes up. He's the master of this session, of the Minase denga session. The master is called the Sosho. I have that term listed in your、uh, key terms below. We'll talk about that. In some more detail below. He is low born. This is very important. He was not born into the samurai class or into the aristocracy. 
he was from low birth, which is unthinkable in classical waka. This is another thing that distinguishes waka, earlier Heian period waka, from denga of the medieval period. It sort of opens up to the public uh, more so than um, earlier waka had. Uh, in other words, well, early waka was confined to the aristocracy. Right? Denga is more open to the general public. Okay, so this is unthinkable in classical waka that somebody from low birth would be a major or the major uh, poet in the genre. He was low born in Ki or Omi province. I'm not really sure which province he was born in. Province is the word for the translation of Kuni, you will remember. This is uh, today's Wakayama or Mie or Shiga prefectures. prefectures. His uh, anthology Shinsen Tsukubashu. The newly compiled Skubai anthology, compiled 1495, represents the ideal of medieval denga. Okay, so yes, he's the major denga poet of the period <coughs> of all of denga. His next is Socho, born in 1448, died in 1532. He is a denga poet and chronicler, disciple of Sogi. So Sogi, like Matsu Obasho in, in the later uh, Gendoku era of the Edo period. He had many disciples, right, who followed him around, went on tr journeys with him, and composed denga linked verse, collaborative linked verse with him. And one of his major disciples is Socho. Uh, after Sogi's death in 1502, Socho wrote the Sogi Shuenki, an account of his, the last moments of Sogi, which is a major source for information about Sogi. Later works included Socho Shuki. Uh, which he wrote later in his life, Socho wrote later in his life, Memoirs of Socho, in which he used Denga and Haikai to describe his travels during that period, and he also wrote Socho Niki. Alright, this is not so important though, so let's go through this as quickly as possible. And the third poet in today's work, uh, the third participant, is Shohaka, born in 1443, died in 1527, He's a scholar, a waka poet, a denga poet, another student of Sogi. He assisted Sogi in editing the Shinsen Tsukubashi that I mentioned above. Uh, his own works include the commentary on Issei Monogatari, called the Issei Monogatari Shobun Sho, and a denga treatise called Shohak Koden. Okay, those are the three participants. Now on to the Kamakura period. Okay, I'm going to introduce the Kamakura period and the Muromachi period, which is the two sort of relevant the two major periods of the medieval uh, phase of Japanese history. Kamakura period begins 1185, so it follows the Heian period. Right, The Heian period breaks apart, things go sour for the aristocracy and for uh, many upper class people of the time, and we move into a new age which is a little darker in uh, theme and tone and so forth. Kamakura period 1185 until three, 1333. So it lasts uh, 150 years or so. Uh, this is a period in which the Minamoto clan, led by Minamoto no Yoritomo, defeats the rival Taira clan. Okay, so these are the Genpei Wars that we talked about in another video, I think. Uh, the Genpei, we have the Gen pitted against the Hei. Again, again, is the Minamoto clan, defeats the Taira clan, makes Kamakura the seat of the shogunate and regent. And be, uh, and yeah, the seat of the regent, or Kampaka. Okay, the era is named for the city where Minamoto Yoritomo set up the headquarters of his military government, the Kamakura Shogunate. Okay. After Minamoto Yoritomo's decisive victory at the Battle of Dan no Ura in 1185, uh, he created his own military administration, which is called the Bakfu, an important word that you should underline, Bakfu, to serve beside the imperial court. Okay, so they, they didn't get rid of the imperial court altogether, obviously. They uh, set up a kind of joint um, authority. In 1192, his authority was given imperial sanction when he was granted the official rank of shogun. Okay, so Yoritomo became the shogun. The hereditary military dictatorship, sometimes translated as generalissimo. Okay, so think of his, him as the kind of generalissimo of this period. After his death in 1199, however... The real power in the Bakfu was wielded by members of the Hojo clan, who acted as shogunal regents, or shikeng is the word, I have the kanji there for that, for the remainder of the period. Okay. So, although the 
um, although the Minamoto clan s sort of took over and started the Kamakura period and led as the shogunate uh, for the first phase, the real power after Yoritomo's death shifted to the Hojo clan. Okay, this is a very important clan in the context of medieval Japanese history. Underline it and look that up if you're interested in this uh, stuff in detail. For the remainder of the period, okay, so the Hojo remains the de facto ruler, basically, for the uh, remainder of the period. The samurai class, so the bushi, or shizoku is another way to say it, replaces the aristocracy as u rulers of Japan during this period. And in these dark days, Buddhism thrives. Okay, so whenever things turn sour, you might say the same thing about Christianity in the West, too. When things turn sour, people turn to uh, religion, right? Uh, understandably so. In dark days, Buddhism thrives. Its influence begins to spread. We have some new, newer forms of uh, Buddhism that appear on the scene during this uh, Kamakura period, namely the Jodo Shu and Zen, which come to dominate. Um, they had appeared, Zen had appeared earlier, but it uh, comes to dominate in this period. While the older aristocracy supported esoteric Shingon and Tendai, uh, which has its base at uh, Mount Hie, or Hiezang, and the in Ryakuji Temple, uh, continue, but not with the same uh, vigor that they had during the Heian period. Okay, so Shingon and Tendai sort of go into decline or become uh, more, more marginalized, while Jodoshu and Zen rise to the dominant position within Buddhism. Uh, key Tendai followers, so Tendai is Tendaishu in Japanese, is the original uh, form of Buddhism that came to Japan and became prominent in the late Nara period, or in the Nara period, and uh, dominates in the Heian period. But its followers, during the Kamakura period, break off into separate, and form their own groups, right? So Nichiren, Dogen, uh, Eisai, Honen, they all come from within the Tendai tradition, but they break off in various directions. We have the populist Nichiren, in the uh, 13th century, breaks off and forms his own Nichiren, Nichiren school of Buddhism. We have Dogen, the philosopher monk of the early 13th century, first half of the 13th century, break off and form his own Soto Zen, Soto Shu, the Soto sect within Zen. We have Eisai, the monk who traveled to extensively throughout China, uh, break off in the early 13th century and form his own Rinzai Zen. Okay? So Rinzai and Soto are the two major forms of Zen within uh, Japanese Buddhism. We have Honen, in the late uh, 12th century and early 13th century, break off and form Jodo Shu. And then after Honen, one of his disciples, uh, Shindang, breaks off even further and forms his, what he calls the Jodo Shinshu, the tr true pure land. Okay, so there's much to talk about here regarding these various sects of uh, Buddhism that break off during this period, but we're not going to go into all that because our point is to get to the uh, work that we're discussing today. Uh, Zen Buddhism, as I mentioned, it had two sects, uh, but they both um, emphasized sort of the same things. Discipline, meditation, concentration, unity of thought and action. Um, their, uh, their strong uh, austerity and discipline appealed to the warrior sensibilities. Okay? So without the warrior uh, class sort of ruling Japan at the time, I don't think we would have seen the rise of Zen like uh, that we did see. All right. Resistance to shogunate dictatorship, however, uh, breaks out in the provinces. The situation becomes unstable. Uh, however, the shogunate maintains harmonious relationship with the Kyoto court, unlike later Ashikaga shogunate. Okay, so it's inherent. It's somewhat unstable in the Kamakura period. However, not as unstable as we will see in the Ashikaga, Ashikaga period. Okay, so the Mongols. During the Kamakura period, the Mongols, sensing instability and weakness, attempted to invade Japan twice in the 13th century, 1274 and 1281. But they were uh, pushed back by samurai with the aid of two very well-timed divine, divine winds, or kamikaze, typhoons that decimated the enemy fleet. The financial strain imposed by the defense efforts against the Mongol attacks, however, further weakened the regime. Okay, so although the Mongol uh, Mongols were unable to mount a successful invasion of Japan, 
it was enough to uh, weaken the regime and eventually destroy it. Okay, so finally, Nitta Yoshisada, okay, underline this name, look him up if you're interested. Uh, he's a loyalist to Emperor Godaigo. He conquers and destroys Kamakura in 1333. So this is the end of the age. When Nitta Yoshisada conquers and destroys Kamakura and reestablishes imperial rule under Emperor Godaigo, who had previously been exiled and expelled. Right? And then we have the uh, division of Japan into two courts, the southern court and the northern court, which we won't get into here. Emperor Godaigo's revolt against the Kamakura shogunate, okay, led by Nitta Yoshisada, in 1331, and the ensuing factional struggles led to the collapse of the Bakufu in 1333. So that's the end of the Kamakura age. Okay. But what about Kamakura culture? What happened culturally during this period? Okay, this era of political uncertainty is reflected in the literature of the period. We have the Shokin, Shinkokin Wakashu that I mentioned above, the new collection of poems, ancient and modern, the eighth major uh, imperial anthology of poetry, which is compiled... Uh, completed in 1206, shows uh, heavy Buddhist themes and a heavy sense of mappo and a sort of degeneration of the age. We see these uh, themes of nostalgia and a sense of degeneration and decline and heavy Buddhist influence, of course, in the Hojoki, which we've already read for this class, right? which came out, which was uh, written in 1212 by Kamono Chome. In the Heike Monogate of the early 14th century, right, so the beginning of the end of the Kamakura period, uh, is a long uh, military gunki account, narrative, that traces the rise and fall of the Taira clan. We see these similar themes of decline and a sense of mappo and so forth. In the monk Yoshida Kenko's Tsure Tsure Gusa, essays in idleness, 1330 to 1332, so at the very end of the Kamakura period, Yoshida Kenko was writing about these, uh, the, the decline of the age and these themes in his work, which we read in this class as well. Okay, so nostalgia for past is a major theme of the liter literature of this period. A sense of mappo, or end days, right? According to the Japanese, mappo, I forget the year it begins, but it, uh, Japan enters the period of decline around this period. The cultural center, imperial capital, blah, 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 blah. So during the Kamakura period, Kyoto had become somewhat marginalized, right? It was once the uh, Heian, of course, is the name for Kyoto at the time. Heian, Kyo, the cultural center during the, Edo, during, during the Hedo, Heian period, uh, was somewhat marginalized during the Kamakura period. However, in the next period, the Ashikaga period, uh, it once again becomes, becomes a seat of political power under the Ashikaga shoguns, which I'll discuss uh, now, right, right after this one. Uh, some further notes about the Kama, culture of the Kamakura period. Early Denga appears, right, which we're discussing today. Haikai, early forms of Haikai appear, Haikai Denga. Uh, we see professional Denga poets appear and uh, increase in number during this period. We see Bushi, or Buddhist sculptors, such as Unke. Unke is the great Bushi of Japan, who, was, uh, was, who flourished in the 12th century, second half 12th century, early 13th century who carves his great sculptures and Buddhist figures in Nara during this period. Um, Kamakura culture is defined by the rise of the warrior class, which I've already talked about, which valorized militant martial skills and Confucian ideals of duty and loyalty. We've already discussed that. Practice of ritual suicide by disembowelment, seppuku, and the cult of the sword emerged during this period. Okay, so in the Heian period, no, you do not find uh, any instances, or many, there might be one or two scattered instances of this, but um, disembowelment, seppuku. Uh, the literary prose genre of the gunki, the most famous being the Heike Monogatai, military chronicles, romantically depicted the heroic but often unsuccessful exploits, exploits of famous warriors. Okay, enough about that. Now on to the Muromachi period. Okay, the Muromachi period, or sometimes called the Ash Ashikaga dynasty, uh, begins in 1336, so immediately following the end of the collapse of the Kamakura shogunate, and ends in 1573, okay, and the period after that, of course, 
after a brief uh, intermission, is the Edo period, which lasted 270 years or whatever. Um, okay, so the Munawachi period, of this is another period of social and political upheaval led by the Ashikaga shogunate, who lived on Muromachi Street in Kyoto. So once again, Kyoto is back at the center of the scene. The era is named after the district in Kyoto where the clan's headquarters were located. The clan never succeeded in extending its political control as far as the Kamakura Bakufu did. So the Bakufu uh, secured its, its power by extending as far into the country as possible. The Ashikaga dynasty was unable to do so. Okay, so provincial warlords, or daimyo, retained a large degree of power during this period. They were able to strongly influence political events and cultural trends during the time, and a rivalry between the increasingly powerful daimyo in the uh, region, the provinces and uh, outer regions and so forth, and the shogunate, located in Kyoto, culminated in the Onin War, or the Onin Nordang, uh, which lasted a decade, starting in 1467. The Kyoto was destroyed during this Onin War, the shogunate's power collapsed. The country plunged into a century of warfare and social chaos known as the Sengoku Jidai. Right? Sengoku Jidai, 1467 to 1615 are the usual dates given. Uh, this, during this period, uh, we saw some great innovations in the economic spheres, also in the artistic spheres. We see the emergence of modern commercial transportation and urban networks during this period. Um, we see contact with China, which had been resumed in the Kamakura period, uh, became even more enriched, transforming Japanese thought and aesthetics. So this is a, an age of sort of globalization and in, increased communication and interaction with China. We see the rise of the further rise of Zen Buddhism, which had been known in Japan since the seventh century, but uh, it really took off during the Kamakura period, as I just mentioned above. Uh, but it really uh, expands its influence even further in this period, uh, as it is embraced by the military class in the thirteenth century. Profound effect on good. Okay, Zen of course has a great influence on government, on arts, on education on general aesthetics and painting and so forth. Ashikaga Shogun's private Kyoto villas served as elegant sen settings and centers of art and culture. Okay, so the period, the Ashikaga period, is usually divided into two major eras. The Nambokcho era, the Northern uh, Dynasty era, era 1336-1392, followed by the Sengoku Jidai, which, as I just mentioned, uh, 1467 to 1573. Onin War marked the start of the Sengoku period, wiped out Kyoto, as I just mentioned, as well as the Bakufu's national authority, leaving a power vacuum that led to a century of war and anarchy. Okay, contact with China increased, as I just mentioned. Specifically, this is China during the Ming Dynasty. The Ming Dynasty, uh, which begins 1368, ends in 1644. This contact was renewed and invigorated. Uh, Ashikaga Shogunate takes over parts of the imperial government. Shinto, the way of the gods, literal, literal translation of Shinto, Kami no Michi, long linked to powerful Buddhism. Okay, so Shinto and Buddhism had hitherto been sort of connected at the hip, as it were, especially with esoteric Shingon, uh, in something called Ryobu. Shinto, or dual Shinto, uh, re-emerges as an autonomous force. So it kind of breaks away from Buddhism during this phase. Spurred by the Mongol invasion and a new sense of national consciousness. Okay, So whenever there's a threat that comes from abroad, uh, Japanese sort of develop a national consciousness vis-a-vis -vis that outside threat. And this new sort of autonomous Shinto is encouraged by the scholar and imperial advisor Kitabatake Chikafusa and other Shinto revivalists and loyalists. And then we have the arrival of the first Europeans. First the Portuguese in the southern Kyushu in 1543 and then the uh, Spanish Jesuits led by Zab, uh, Javier in 1549 initiating the period of Namban trade, 
okay, so trade with the Portuguese, and which lasts until 1614 when it's suddenly prohibited in the Edo period, uh, 1543, and then followed by the Spanish uh, arrive in Japan in 1587. So first the Portuguese, then the Spanish Jesuitia, then the Dutch in 1609. So three phases of European arrival, the Portuguese, followed by the Spanish Jesuits, then the Dutch in 1609. Um, attention to the outside is intensified with increase in foreign trade. Muromachi period ends when last the last Ashikaga shogunate, Yoshiaki, is forced out of Kyoto by the Owari province daimyo, the famous Oda Nobunaga. Okay. Uh, Muromachi period is the period in which we find the uh, origins, the development of much of what we today consider to be Japanese aesthetics. Okay, so a lot of this stuff emerged and developed during the Muromachi period. Namely, okay, I have a list here, follow along on the list, Wabi. The sense of Wabi, a transient of stark beauty, spiritual wealth and material poverty. Sabi sort of withered aesthetic, rustic simplicity, quietness, understated elegance, wabi-sabi, you've all heard of this, beauty or serenity that comes, serenity that comes with age. You again, this sense of profound depth, grace, subtlety. You again is a key aesthetic term that often appears in the context of the no drama and in Nenga drama or Nenga link poetry. Chano Yu, the tea ceremony, it was developed by Sen no Rikyo. Okay, I have an explanation about that. You can read that on your own. Ikebana, no drama, right, is the major form of classical Japanese drama performed since the 14th century, developed by Kan Ami and his son Zeami. Okay, and Buddhist concerns and themes and messages are very prominent in this art form. Bonsai, Zoen, landscape gardening and so forth. So a lot of the traditional uh, images that you have of traditional Japan uh, emerged during this Muromachi period. Okay, emphasis, a great, all of these artistic forms have a strong emphasis on transience and impermanence and so forth. Um, why is this? Uh, one reason given is that national culture was centered around the Bakufu headquarters in Kyoto with their military and a somber, spartan, austere ethics and aesthetics. Also, Zen, which plays a major full role in spreading news. <laughs> Next on your note, I have your, uh, a name here, Yoshimoto Nizo, uh, born in 1320, died in 1388, who's a regent or Kampaku of the Northern Dynasty during the Nambokcho period. Uh, in the second half of the 14th century. Um, his, this is a name that often comes up in studies of Renga. He assumed the role as major patron of Renga. He was, uh, is, the rules of Renga were established during his lifetime. He was an influential editor of Renga and who edited the Tsukubashu, Tsukubai Anthology, uh, compiled 1356, the first anthology of Denga, uh, which was started after the termination of the imperial, the last imperial Waka anthology. And he famously said that connection or kakari is the soul of Denga. This is a quote that often is cited in studies of Denga, who said that Denga is not about the original, the individual verse, it's about the connections between the verse the links between the two, is the soul of Denga. So keep that in your mind as we read the Denga sequence. Okay, on now to the more literary stuff. Enough of the historical background. Waka. All right, I've already discussed Waka in a few videos. You should be familiar with it by now, but to review very briefly, uh, Waka, also called Uta or Tanka, same thing. Right? Tanka is used more in the modern period, but the p word appears in classical uh, times as well. Waka is the dominant mode of poetry in Heian in, Kamak, early, well, in the Kamakura periods, and it's eventually displaced by Denga. A single waka is a unified whole, consisting of five lines of 575 plus 77 seven syllables. Syllable pattern. 575 five, seven, five plus 77 seven is a waka. 
and it's an uh, independent whole. And in in Denga linked verse, this five seven five seven five seven five plus seven seven uh, unified whole is broken up into two parts of five seven five and seven seven. So Denga splits apart what was unified in Waka. Keep that in mind as we read the Denga sequence, the hundred stanza Denga sequence. Physical world is filtered through inner emotional experience. That's sort of one of the defining characteristics of Waka, of the Heian period. Right? You don't describe the world objectively. You describe it as it is uh, filtered through human uh, interpretation and human emotional experience and so forth. Um, major theme in Waka is the fleeting or momentary nature of all life and beauty. Waka employs Kigo, which we've already discussed. I've made three vid lecture videos on Kigos or seasonal words. See the video for the major 500 Kigo that are very important in Waka. Waka also employs Kake Kotoba, or double entendre, puns, pivot words. This word is sometimes translated as. And I give you a list of examples of famous or uh, frequently employed kake kotoba. Matsu is probably the most famous one, which can mean either pine, the tree, a pine tree, or to wait or to pine for somebody. Matsu, same word, homonyms. Uh, aki can mean to grow weary or tired of somebody, to akiru. Or it can mean aki as in autumn. Furu is another one, can mean depending on... Uh, which kanji you have in your mind as you read the waka. To fall, furu. To shake, furu. Old, furu. To age, to grow old, furu. Or it can mean uh, your birthplace, as in furu sato no furu. Ake is another one, can mean to, bright, to dawn or brighten, to open up, or vermilion bright red. Nagame is another famous one, to gaze longingly, it can mean. Or it can mean long spring rains. Urami is another one. Mirume is another famous one. It can mean seaweed or seeing eyes. Right? So when you want to use a word as a kakikotoba, you don't write the kanji. If you write the kanji, it's specified. Right? If you write it in hiragana, the reader doesn't know whether you mean mirume as in seaweed, the kanji for seaweed, or if you mean mirume, me, me, eyes that see. Yoru is another one. Right? If you write it with the kanji, it can be uh, designated or it made explicit as uh, night, or to draw near, or to approach, or to twist. But if you write in hiragana, the reader doesn't know which of those, and you can uh, sim simultaneously sort of use all of those meanings in your poem. Moru can mean to leak, or it can mean to protect or to guard, right? Ama is a nun, or a pearl-collecting diving woman. Or the heavens it can mean any of those. So if you want to use uh, in, insert some ambiguity into your poem, you write it in hiragana, and the reader doesn't know which of those three uh, meanings you intend. Tabi is another one. Journey, this time it can mean journey or this time. Okay, and there are many others. You can add to this list as you look into this kakikotoba stuff. Uh, mitate jo is another thing. Okay, makura kotoba is another key word in waka poetry. Uh, literally means p pillow words. Sometimes translated as fixed epithets. Uh, these are usually five syllables. They appear in the waka itself, right? They first appear in the uta of the kojiki and the nihongi, but they're established uh, in the mayo period, right? The mayo shu period, by the in the poems of Kakinomoto no hitomado. Right, who was writing in the eighth, late eighth century or late seventh century? Sorry, <clears throat> and he coined half of those uh, words that he used. So half of the major makura kotoba, when you look at a list, half of them were co coined by uh, Hitomaro. Uh, they became conventions and lost their meaning with time. So later poets would use them just for their sound, for their oral, oral effect, right? Without really. Um, emphasizing their original meanings, which had uh, often been forgotten. The, some of the famous ones that are often mentioned, Hisakata no, right? and that, follows, uh, that precedes a set noun that always follows it, Ashihiki no, uh, this is usually followed by Yama, Ashihiki no, and then Yama, whatever, 
in the next uh, line of the stanza. Nubatamano, or Ubatamano, is another famous one that I think we discussed in my Nakanishi book. And there are many others you can add to that list. Okay, moving on. Jokotoba. Jokotoba are preface words or phrases in a waka, similar to makura kotoba, but without syllable restriction. So makura kotoba was specifically a uh, five-syllable phrase or word. Right, this one doesn't have syllable restriction and without a fixed object. Right, so the one above, uh, ashi hiki no, for example, is almost always followed by yama. With jokotoba, uh, there aren't such restrictions uh, regarding what follows. And these two can these can involve double meanings or puns as well. Engo, related words. These are culturally or phonetically linked words. Conventionally associated words, semantically related words, used on different positions of a waka. You can find lists of, of common engo and make uh, add to that description there. Utamakura, poetic place names or top, toponisms, sites with established associations, descriptive epithets, circumlocutions, designing geographical sites. Two examples of Yoshino, right, or Shinobu Yama. So basically, place names that are thrown in there because they have certain associations that everyone is familiar with, right? And they can also contain a little uh, pun within them. Shinobu also has within it the word Shinobu, which can mean to long for someone or to sneak, uh, to behave stealthily. To um. These and other devices help overcome the limitations inherent in the very short waka poem. Waka poems are only 31 syllables. You have uh, limited space to convey maximal meaning and these various conventions and devices enable you to uh, do so, to convey as much meaning as possible. Alright, next is a short description of the Kokin Wakashu. Kokin Wakashu is the first uh, anthology, collection of poems ancient and modern, completed in, 19, in 905. The early Heian Waka collection, the first of the 21 anthologies compiled by imperial decree. Enormous influence on all subsequent anthologies, especially the Shin Kokin Wakashu, or the new Kokin Wakashu. Uh, this was envisioned, or the idea was conceived by Emperor Uda who reigned 887 to 897. It was ordered by Emperor Daigo, uh, who reigned in, from 897 to 930, and it was compiled by Kino Tsudayuki. That's Underline that name. He's the, the great editor and compiler and poet of the Kokinshu, who wrote the preface that I'll read below. Uh, compiled by Kino Tsudayuki, as well as Kino Tomonori, and some other names there. The compilers chose... 1,111 poems. All right. Depending on you count on how you count the poems, uh, some say it's 1,140. But for now, uh, it's easy to remember 1111 number of poems. Mostly waka, but some other ones. Nearly half belong to the love category, the koi, which we see in Denga poetry. All right. uh, the kokinshu includes two prefaces, a kana preface, or kanajo, Written by Kino Tsurayuki, uh, to, written to set apart Japanese aesthetics from Chinese aesthetics. And there's also a mana preface, a mana jo, written in Chinese, right? ostensibly by Kino Yoshimochi, a testament to the lingering influence of Chinese poetics in the early 10th century. Okay, so the kana preface is usually the one that is cited by everybody. Okay, And I will read. The kana preface, the first paragraph of it is extremely famous. I'll read it here in Japanese and then in uh, Dan Keen's translation. Yamato uta wa hito no kokoro o tane to shite, yorozu no koto no hato zo nade di keru. Yo no naka ni aru hito, koto waza shigeki mono nareba, kokoro ni omou koto o miru mono kiku mono ni tsukete i dasheru nadi. Hananinaku 
男女の中をも柔らげ、たけき者の風の心をも慰さむるは歌なり。はい。And the translation offered by Donald Keen here is <clears throat> I'm sorry, not Donald Keen.、Uh, here's McCulloch's, McCulloch's translation. Helen McCulloch, I think is her name. Japanese poetry has the human heart as seed and myriads of words as leaves. It comes into being when men use the seen and the heard to give voice to feelings aroused by the innumerable events in their lives. The song of the warbler among the blossoms, the voice of the frog dwelling in the water, these teach us that every li living creature sings. It is song that moves heaven and earth without effort. Stirs emotions in the invisible spirits and gods, brings harmony to the relations between men and women, and calms the hearts of fierce warriors. Okay, that's from McCulloch's 1985 translation of the Kokinshu, I think. Following the Mayoshi structure, the Kokinshu includes 20 books, or Maki, right? These books, or maki, are arranged not chronologically or by author, but rather according to certain subjects, certain progressions. Within those categories, the poems were arranged by natural progression, by the natural and ceremonial sequences of seasonal happenings, or by a progression based on the development of a courtly love affair. Okay, so. Then I provide a list of the 20 maki, or books of the Kokinshu. Books 1 to 6 are the four seasons. Book 1 and 2, spring. Book 3, natsu. Remember that natsu and fuyu, summer and winter, are not as、uh, important in Japanese, traditional Japanese aesthetics. Spring and autumn are the most important. Book 4, autumn. And autumn, being one of, the most, one of the two most important seasons, has two、uh, books autumn one and autumn two in book five. Book six has winter by itself.、Right? Winter does not continue into the next book. Book seven to ten, we have Gano Uta, felicitations, right?、Uh, celebrating the birth of somebody or、uh, hoping for the long life of somebody, an emperor, for example. Uh, for the long imperial reign, celebrating it or hoping、uh, it, that it happens. Book eight, we have parting, wakare no uta, or ribetsu ka, in Japanese pronunciation, or Chinese pronunciation, onyomi pronunciation. Book nine, are travel poems, anything having to do with travel is included here. Book ten has the names of things, alright?、Uh, names of things are put into the Uh, poems hidden, and this, these have a strong ludic or playful quality in these、uh, butsume, mono no na poems. Books 11 to 15 are all koi poems or love poems. So, book 11, koi 1, love 1. Book 12, love 2. Book 13, love 3. Book 14, love 4. Book 15, love 5. And then we have book 16, the aisho or laments. Anything having to do with the death of somebody. Okay, so these are mournful po poems, waka, about somebody's death. But they don't want to spend too much time on death and mournful things, so they move on. Books 17, 17 and 18 are mis miscellaneous、uh, poems, or zoka. Book 18, miscellaneous 2. Zoka. Book 19 has more miscellaneous forms called zatte, and these include、uh, sort of non standard poetic forms. So here we find choka, which was the long form. You remember that、uh, choka and tanka were the first two poetic forms to emerge, right? In the Mayoshi, we see lots of choka, which soon died out. So choka, the form of writing for extended stanzas for that extend for over a page or over two pages, three pages. That existed in the very beginning of、uh, the development of Japanese poetry, but it did not last. It died out, and tanka, or waka, or uta, became the dominant form. 
However, we see sort of a return to the Chihoka form very briefly in Book 19 of the Kokinshu here. We also see Sedoka, which is another non-standard form. We see Haikaika, or Haikai no Uta, right? Haikai will reappear in later in Japanese history with Matsuo Basho, right, who writes Haikai Renga. But we see its origins here in the Book 19 of the Kokinshu. And other non-standard poetic forms are included, all thrown in here in Book 19. And then the last book, Book 20, has the uh, folk music office songs, or Bureau of Poetry song, court poems. Okay, So the Kami Asobi no Uta. These are songs to entertain the gods, or and it also includes Azuma Uta, or Eastern Dialect Waka. Okay, that was a description of the wak the Kokin Wakashu. Now I have the con description of the Shin Kokin Wakashu, which is also very important in the context of Renga. This was presented in, two in 1206. This is the eighth of the 21 imperial anthologies. So after we ha this comes out, we still have 13 to go before the uh, imperial anthology uh, sequence ends. <laughs> This is compiled by the Japanese court. The last one, by the way, was uh, came out in 1439. Called the Shin Shoku Kokin Wakashu. Um, the Shin Kokin Wakashu resembles the first anthology in form and structure, uh, but it's very different in tone and themes. The top three most, it's among the top three most influential poetic anthologies. It was commissioned in 1201 by the retired Emperor Gotoba, who established a new Bureau of Poetry at his Nijo Palace with 11 fellows headed by Fujiwara no Yoshitsune for the purpose of conducting poetry contests and compiling the anthology. And as I mentioned at the very beginning of this video, the retired Emperor Gotoba is of course the emperor who is uh, commemorated in the opening lines of today's work. Uh, the Shin Kokin Wakashu covered not only contemporary poets, but a broad range of poetic ages, more so than the Kokinshu. So it's, it represents a larger uh, swath of history than the Kokinshu does, a larger range of history, including ancient poets, ancient poems that the editors of the first anthology had deliberately excluded. Okay, presented in 1205, as I mentioned on the 300th anniversary of the completion of the Kokinshu. So 300 years had passed between the first uh, anthology, the Kokinshu, and the eighth anthology, the Shin Kokin Wakashu. Okay, moving on now. Denga. What is Denga? Okay, I've already discussed this in other videos, but we'll review very quickly here. Denga, collaborative linked poetry. Developed out of Waka, or Uta, or Tanka, the Waka tradition, it served a spiritual or religious purpose as well as an aesthetic period purpose. Okay, so this religious or spiritual element or purpose is not so prevalent in earlier Waka, but it's very important here in Nenga. This is something you will want to remember. It's not exclusively aesthetic. It's a, a way, it was regarded as a way or a means to awaken to Buddhist truth. And we see that very much in the denga that we're reading today. Okay, what is denga? It is a sequence of two or more linked stanzas. Stanza is the word that we will use hereafter for the Japanese word ku. Okay. A stanza or a ku is a divided waka. Remember, waka was 57577. Five, seven. A ku is divided into two parts. It divides the waka into two parts of 575 five or 77. Seven. Okay, so a denga sequence then is a 575 five, ku followed by a 7-7 seven, seven ku, and then a 7-7, seven, seven, followed by 5-7-5, five, seven, five, and so on, until the final ageku, which is the last ku of the Renga sequence. That can be 30, or it can be, 30, or it can be 100, it can be 32, depending on how long the sequence is. Renga is composed by a group, typically between three and six poets, who are often friends, and who often share the same skill level. So a, a master poet would not invite uh, somebody who's not very good at writing poetry to uh, compose the s sequence with him. 
It's very courtly and refined, but not as strict as earlier waka. Okay, so we see a gradual loosening of the rules over time. Waka, traditional waka in the Heian period, very strict in its rules. Denga, less so. Haikai denga, by the time we get to Matsu Obasho in the Edo period, even less so. The earliest examples of denga are found in the poem exchanges in the Man Yoshio. Okay, but those are just uh, a few and very minor, so it's not an important form in the Manyo period, but it becomes an important form, uh, form here. Our, the original Renga style can be found in the Shinkokin Wakashio, which I just mentioned, 1206, uh, Fujiwara no Teika, who's the major poet of the Shinkokin Wakashio, and his associates had a toyed with the form as an amusement. Okay, so there's some Renga found there. Development from a pastime into a serious art, however, happens in the 12th century, and by the late 14th century, Denga is equal in popularity to the Waka. Okay, and after that, it displaces, or replaces the Waka in status. Poets gather in the house of the host poet for a session. Okay, not always the house, obviously, as we see in the Minase sequence, it's at the Minase. Actually, it is... Composed at somebody's house, I think. Um, followed by a banquet. So the poets gather, usually at somebody's house. They sit around, they compose the sequence, and then at once that's finished, they have a big party with a banquet, banquet and uh, hosts and so forth. Um, okay, uh, in Denga, past aesthetic standards continue to hold sway. But they weren't so demanding or rigorous in relation to the classics. There's an increasingly popular or plebeian element in these uh, Nenga poems of the medieval period. Conservatives increasingly were worried that it was becoming too popular. Okay. Uh, artistic energy was focused less on individual verses than on the links between them. The kakari, as I mentioned above. Kakari is the soul of Nenga, as... Uh, Yoshimoto famously said. Here is what Carter, Stephen Carter, whose translation we, we are using today, says about Denga verse, linked verse. The essence of linked verse sequence, then, is a dialectical movement that produces now a prosaic scene, now a more striking one, here a simple extension, there a complete change in interpretation, setting off exclamations against size and speaking for a host of people, including travelers, lovers, old men, recluses, peasants, and emperors, all in a symphonic structure that contains the poems within a forma, formal whole while resisting comprehensive interpretations. Okay. Speaking for a host of people is important, right? The poets are not necessarily speaking for themselves, right? They're speaking for a whole host of people. So it's, in a sense, a fictional genre. This is something to keep in mind as you read it. Very different from rom ro later romantic, modern, uh, self-expressive, self-expressionist modes of poetry. Uh, a Renga sequence, Nenga sequence involves three types of poetic units. Okay, about this Barnhill, whose essay, uh, link to the, his essay I included at the beginning of the study guide, Barnhill writes the following about the three types of poetic units. The sequence as a whole, so the entire, in our case here, the hundred verse sequence, the hundred stanza sequence, the verse link, so the 575 and the 77 together, or 77 followed by the 55 together, and third, the stanza, or the individual coup. Okay. The identity and integrity of each of these poetic units is real, but is only provisional and relative. Each is characterized by what we might call inter-identity. As a whole, okay, so the first of the three types of poetic units, the whole, the sequence as a whole, as a whole, the Renga sequence as a whole does have an identity, but one that is at the same time undermined by the discontinuity of the sequence of linking. Okay, and regarding 
the verse link not being a waka, so the 575 plus 77 or 77 plus 575 is not a, an autonomous um, unified waka. And about this fact, Barnhill writes, each verse link is not a singular unified poem as traditional waka is. It is a poetic linking of two distinct stanzas. Each verse link then, then not only lacks an abiding identity, it disappears with the next verse length, link. It is a linking of two poetic units rather than a discrete organic unity. So in short, each stanza is not a fixed waka, each stanza link is not a fixed waka, but rather a, a meaning complex is the word that Barnhill uses. And he writes, each stanza does have, does have its own integrity, its words are distinct from those of other stanzas, but these words by themselves involve what we might call a meaning complex, a range of possible meanings. The precise meaning of these words depends on the particular maiku or tsukeku it links with. Each stanza, then, has only provisional or relative identity. Within the sequence, it inter-exists with two other stanzas. Okay, so underline this word meaning complex. This is a, a useful concept in reading Nenga. Alright, so a word, a, a single stanza by itself might have several possible or implicit or inherent meanings, but those are not made explicit until the next verse comes along and the next poet decides how to, which of those possible meanings to. Uh, to draw out and to flesh out, and to emphasize. Barnhill concludes the following, and this is a long quote I will read, Denga then can be said to embody the Buddhist notion of non-self. Okay, this is a very important point in Barnhill's essay that links Denga to Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist thought. So Denga embodies the Buddhist notion of non-self or Anatman in Sanskrit, Muga in Japanese. <clears throat> One of the three basic characteristics of reality, according to Buddhism, is that our conventional idea of the selfness of things and persons is a delusion. There are no independently existing singular entities. Rather, the universe is characterized by radical interdependence. This doctrine is an attempt to steer a middle course between monism which asserts that the universe is a unitary whole with the apparent difference between parts fundamentally unreal, and atomism, which asserts that entities exist as discrete objects and the universe is the accumulation of all these distinct parts. Okay, so the doctrine of the non-self, or the non-identity of things, seeks to steer a middle course between these two extremes of monism and atomism. And going on, Barnhill writes, Buddhism claims that all things in the universe come into being and exist interdependently. Everything, whether a tree or a person, radically coexists with the rest of the universe. As such, no object has simple identity, and the whole similarly lacks a simple unity. The universe is a set of interrelationships. There is only a vast expanse of inter-identities. The very textuality of Renga, then, embodies this characteristic of non-self or inter interdependent coexistence. Each stanza does have the individuality of its words. However, the meaning of the words are provisional, dependent on the maiku and skeku. <laughs> Similarly, each five-line five five verse link is a poetic unit. Each five link verse link is a poetic unit, unit separate from all the others. However, it shares its words with the verse links it follows and precedes and is a joining of two stanzas rather than a single poetic whole. And the Renga sequence as a whole has its own identity as a particular flow of imagery, but is not a single poem. <laughs> It is a pattern succession of distinct textual inter-identities. 
Okay, next, Barnhill then criticizes Earl Miner's approach of writing the Ku 1, stanza 1, and Ku 2, or stanza 2, as one five-line verse linked, followed by Ku 2 and three verse linked, and so forth until the final Ku. And he uh, criticizes this approach that Miner uses, uh, because it gives the impression that a 7, fi uh, 5, 7, 5, plus a 7, 7 uh, verse link, is a unified whole, right? It sort of emphasizes a unity that is not really there in the original Japanese way of reading Denga, according to Barnhill. And Barnhill criticizes Minor writing the following. This approach emphasizes that each stanza is not a self-existent poetic unity. It functions as a link to preceding and succeeding stanzas, and the meaning of the words is relative to these other stanzas. However, each stanza does have a degree of identity, its words and their complex mean, meaning complex. To consider the Renga simply as a sequence of overlapping five-line verses is to blur this identity and to suggest that the verse links are discrete, organic wholes. To emphasize the relative integrity of the stanzas, then, each should be printed separate from the others. Okay, so in short, the successive kami no ku, the above stanza, and the shimo no ku, the, the below stanza, the next stanza, were joined to make an integral poetic unit with its predecessor, and therefore its successor, but without semantic connection with any other stanza in the sequence made of such alternations. All right. Okay. Some kind of messy notes there. Uh, so in short, 700 years of popularity Denga enjoys from uh, the early phase all the way up to the modern period, to Meiji period. And in the modern period, Meiji period, Denga dies. Okay, Maso, Masaoka Shiki famously said, Denga wa bungaku ni arazu. So Masaoka Shiki waged war against this traditional uh, form of collectively uh, composed verse, and he essentially, along with others and along with the uh, influences from uh, Western literature, put an end to this long standing tradition. Collective spirit, collective denga, is crushed by modernity. Uh, so we have this flood of ideas about authorship, the work of art being an autonomous microcosm, the ideas of individual expression, and so forth, become prominent in the modern period, thus putting an end to this long tradition. Uh, crucially, Barnhill notes the following. Each stanza stands in relation only to the adjoining stanzas. It's maiku and skiku. The third stanza is not read in relation to the first. At the point of the third stanza, the first stanza had disappeared from the text. Disappeared, underline this word here, this is very important. So when you write writing a sequence, I write, say, stanza set number seven. The next poet writes stanza number eight. The next poet, when he writes stanza number nine, must forget what I wrote here, right? Ideally, anyways. Of course, it sort of lingers in his mind somewhere, and it's without my stanza number seven, we wouldn't be at the the stage where he's at there. However, uh, he, the uh, sort of rule or convention is to make disappear or forget uh, the uchikoshi verse, which is the preceding preceding stanza, and this is the point that uh, Barnhill's making here. There is only a single verse linked, a five-line combination of maiku and skiku. When the second and third stanzas are linked together, the first stanza, the one that I wrote here, textually does not exist. The when the third stanza is, when the third stanza is linked with the third, three, four, the stanza, second stanza, each stanza exists only momentarily. Okay. All right, moving on now. Uh, denga is sometimes divided into two types that I mentioned above, ushin and mushin. Okay, so coming back to this, these two words, ushin and mushin. Ushin denga. What is ushin denga? Ushin literally means having a heart or having sensibility, sometimes translated as. 
This is the older, orthodox, pathos-filled, emotion-filled, philosophically profound, highly subjective, refined form of denga. It employs, employs courtly language and themes. It has a strong emphasis on semantic meaning. Okay? And in contrast with that, we have the mushin denga. And you'll remember that the earliest forms of denga, we had the ushin group and the mushin group gathered together and composed uh, linked verse alternately. The mushin denga is the opposite of the ushin denga. Literally means without heart or without sensibility. This is the lighter, non-standard, playful, sometimes vulgar, or madcap, or, or diversion denga. Okay, kyoka, which is the last of the uh, collaboratively composed uh, linked verse genres that appear in Jap Japanese literary history, sometimes translated as madcap waka, derives from this strand of mushin denga. And the emphasis here is not on semantic meaning, but phonetic pronunciation. Okay, so a lot of wordplay and puns and so forth are more prominent here in Mushin Denga. Alright, moving on. The progression of verse links, or Denku, forms a plotless narrative with many constantly shifting mini-plots. Okay, so in the Denga that we're reading today, the 100 stanza Denga, it's a progression of verse links that form a plotless narrative with many constantly shifting mini-plots. There is no story. There is no chronological progression of events. Just a kaleidoscopic array of images and scenes, landscapes, seasons, and so forth. Seasonal images and so forth. A poet uses the maiku, the preceding stanza, as the starting point or basis for his new responding stanka, stanza, or the tsukiku. So the maiku and the tsukiku. Maiku is sort of the starting point for each poet. So I write stanza 9. The next poet writes stanza 10 using my maiku as his starting point. Okay? And his uh, tsukiku will offer a fresh perspective on the meaning of my maiku. So I might have written my, ku, my stanza with a certain image or a certain idea of what it means in my head, but when that reaches the next guy, he might see something completely different in what I wrote. And... Uh, draw out those meanings that are uh, implicit in mine, but which I might have not have, might not have even uh, been cognizant of. Which obviously is temporarily, temporarily, and temporarily, temporarily, or provisionally, tentatively, completing the verse, as it were. Okay, so he or she completes what I wrote. Okay, so I write say a five seven five stanza. The next poet writes seven seven skeku to complete it, as it were. But the completion is only temporary, or tentative, provisional, right? It only lasts a brief moment, and then the next poet uh, moves on and further advances the sequence. Okay? A single stanza, or a ku, has no connection. So this is returning to the point about how the uh, preceding, preceding stanza disappears. A single stanza, or ku, has no connection, kakari, beyond what preceded it, and what follows it. Constant alteration prevents repetition. So repetition is always bad. You don't want to return to what somebody wrote. You don't want to repeat what somebody has already said. You want to constantly move forward. The process of 575 plus 77 or 77 plus 575 dialogical unit making builds into interdependent sequence and as I mentioned above, Yoshimoto Nijo famously said, in Denga, the connection of the Kakari comes first. Connection is its poetry. Its poetry is its connection, Kakari. For him, the connection, Kakari, is the soul of Denga. What happens in the spaces between the stanzas is where the interest lies. Okay, Denga. Okay, then I have a note about the Tenja, or the judges, uh, who judge or rank the... Uh, each of the stanzas, not so important. Shinku, soku, important terms that I uh, note down in the terms below. I think we've already discussed these, but I'll discuss them again here briefly. Shinku, soku. Alright, moving on now to Haikai Lenga. So just very briefly here about Haikai Lenga, which we've already discussed, we've already read. 
some uh, examples of Haikai Denga with Matsuo Basho. This is the phase of uh, Denga, of Japanese poetry, that comes after a traditional Denga. This is non-standard. Haikai literally means non-standard or unorthodox. Non-standard Denga derived from previous Denga. Initially an amusement, as Denga had also been, but becomes more serious with the evolution of the Taimon schools, school, the Dandin school, and finally the Shofu, Shofu school of Matsuo Basho. The Taimon school was founded by Matsunaga Teitoka, the Dandin school founded by Nishiyama Sowing, and Sho, Matsuo Basho was associated with both of those schools, but he eventually founded his own school, which is sort of the culmination of Haikai Denga, the Shofu school. Haikai Denga is characterized by an embrace of disparate elements, occasional common speech and themes, so more common speech and themes that we saw than we saw in Denga, which itself had more uh, common speech and common themes than we saw in traditional Waka. So there's a sort of democratization, a popularization, a zokka, is the word uh, Ishikawa Jun uses at one point um, in his writings, that takes place over time in the uh, field of traditional Japanese poetry. Humor, parody, a rough haikai spirit or haiyi uh, that fuses classical forms with contemporary reality. Okay, so the, it's very important to note that they're not rejecting the tradition altogether. They're still drawing from the tradition. Matsuo Basho is still uh, using all kinds of allusions and intertextuality in his works, uh, citing, uh, in, citing uh, quotations and phrases and themes and so forth from classical Chinese and Japanese poetry, from the Zhuangzi and so forth. But they're doing it with a new kind of sensibility, a new modern, not a new early modern sensibility. Henka and Atarashimi become important concepts. Henka is change, the idea of change that Matsuo Basho specifically development, develops in his Haikai Renga, the idea of Atarashimi, which is important to the aesthetics of Matsuo Basho as well, which emphasize surprise and a sudden introduction of new context and juxtaposition in the skiku. Okay. That, so things that uh, the earlier traditional Denga poets would not have thought of uh, are suddenly being employed in later Haikai Denga of Matsuo Basho and so forth. Okay, and in his book on Matsuo Basho, Traces of Dreams, the prominent contemporary scholar, uh, Anglophone scholar, Haro Shirane explains how a single line of Haikai was traditionally appreciated in four contexts simultaneously. Okay, and I think you could expand this description uh, to extend this description to, to earlier traditional Denga as well, not, not exclusively Haikai Denga. Okay, so but about these four contexts, Shirane writes, the four contexts were, one, in isolation, so reading the stanza just, just by itself as a kind of haiku, or proto-haiku, remember haiku developed later in the modern period. Two, in relation to the previous verse, so the maiku, in relation to the maiku. Three, as a shift away from or recontextualization of the penultimate verse. Okay, so penultimate verse is Shirane's term for the preceding preceding verse, or the uchikoshi, the one that you're supposed to forget when you write your verse. Right. So if I'm writing verse 9, I'm supposed to forget verse 7. Right. That's the third context in which to read it. And four, as part of the general flow and mood of the larger sequence, of the entire uh, 100 stanza sequence, or 32 stanza sequence, and so forth. All right. Uh, flow, I have it emboldened there, because flow is an important term in Lenga poetry. The Japanese is yukiyo, and I'll discuss that term below. Okay, so flow. Whenever you see flow, the word flow used uh, by scholars of Denga, they usually they usually have in mind this idea of yukiyo, which I'll explain below. Only the first context survived into the modern period. This is an important point. Okay, so of the four contexts of reading uh, Denga verse, Haikai Denga verse included, uh, only the first survived, namely the way of reading it in isolation. All the others disappeared. This is a tragedy, I think, in, for a lot of. Uh, not for a lot of people, for, for some modern writers, including Ishikawa Jun, who's uh, the writer that I, I'm sort of most familiar with, he lamented this fact that um, people forgot how to read linked verse in the modern period. 
Okay, so only the first context survived into the modern period. The other three disappeared in the wake of Masaoka Shiki's invention of the modern haiku, a modern t term derived from hokku, or the first line of a sequence in the Me Meiji period. Okay. Moving on. Shikimoku. These are the rules or conventions. Shikimoku is a word I've already used uh, numerous times in the other videos. What is shikimoku? Shikimoku is the complex set of rules and stylistic requirements in Denga, standardized during the Kamakura and Muromachi periods, simplified and popularized during the Edo period. Okay, so these rules, set of rules are very complex in the early classical period, in the Heian period. They eventually become more popular and uh, simpler with time. These rules, what do they do? What's their purpose? They ensure that change, impermanence, transience, fleetingness, uh, fugitive quality, rather than fixity, stasis, organic unity, and so forth, are the fundamental characteristics of Denga. Okay. So I would not necessarily all of these rules uh, serve this function, but many of them do. According to Stephen Carter, he writes the following, and I quote this extended passage from Carter. First rule of the Shikimoku is the rule that each verse in the sequence must stand on its own, semantically and grammatically. Second general rule is that each verse must combine with its predecessor, its maiku, to form a complete poetic statement. So those are the major two general shikimoku conventions or rules. Then comes a host of prescriptions that in some demand variety and constant change in the sequence. One set limiting the number of poems running in series in the primary categories versus in the categories of autumn and spring restricted to at the most five verses in series. Those in winter, summer, travel, Shinto, Buddhism, lamentations, mountains, waters, and dwellings to three. Another limiting repetition, another set limiting repetition, for example, Azalea once, wild geese twice, the world, yo, five times, and so on. And still another set of rules limiting the recurrence of thematic and lexical categories, words, and images. For example, images of the category love, coit, to be separated by at least five verses. Instances of pine, the pine tree, to be separated by at least seven, and so on. In a word, the rules, shikimoku, demand that every full sequence represent the entire court tradition. All of the categories of the Imperial Uta anthologies and other revered works, the court, the entire court tradition, but in a way that allows no one topic, theme, or idea to dominate the whole. Even the images that are virtually required by tradition to appear in every sequence, for example, the moon and the cherry blossoms, right? The tsuki no joza and the hana no joza that we've already talked about, are restricted to eight and four appearances, respectively, making it certain that neither will preponderate. All right. It's a quote from Carter, 1991. <clears throat> Moving on now. Next is the Kasen, which we've already discussed. We've read uh, at least two Kasen in this class so far. Kasen are 36 verse denga. I think I said 32 earlier in this video. Correct that. It's 36 uh, stanzas that are included in a Kasen uh, form of denga. Kasen is the major form of Haikai denga. All right, so this is the form that Matsu Basho often wrote in. The Kasen form becomes most popular with Matsu Basho's Kasen. For example, Ichi Nakawa, which we've already read, out in the street, 1690. Uh, his other famous Kasen include Hatsu Shigure, Winter Rain, Natsu no Tsuki, Summer Moon, Kirigirisu, Autumn Cricket, and so forth. Uh, kasen have looser set of rules, so the Shikimoku rules are still there but they're not as strict as they were in Denga and previous uh, classical Heian period, uh, pre-modern classical um, Waka. Uh, Kasen allows for more humor, more wit, more slang, more use of Kango or Chinese words, uh, more mixing of Ga and Zoku. Ga and Zoku are two very important words you should know underline these words. Ga means refined, aristocratic, 
elegant and so forth. Zoka means vulgar or not with a negative sense necessarily, especially in Matsu Basho. Vulgar is not necessarily a bad thing, keep in mind. Uh, ordinary, court, common, non-aristocratic. I think it's probably the most neutral translation of Zoka. Okay, Kasen, more about Kasen. Literally, it means that. We've already discussed that. Uh, 36 verse. Basho, Matsu Basho was involved in literally hundreds of Kasen. The form predates him. So there are Kasen that were uh, came before Basho, but he refined and popularized the form and perfected it into a high art. Before the 1650s, most sequences were 100 verse Hyakuin, right, which we're reading today, the Hyakuin, or 50 verse Renga, Gojuin. But by the time of Basho's death, the Kasen dominated. Okay. So by the time of Basho's death, you do not find uh, very many instances of Hyakuin Renga. Okay, moving on. We're uh, slowly becoming more specific in our uh, discussion here in the study guide. We started very generally with the uh, general bird's eye overview of the whole historical epochs. And now we're moving uh, slowly into the work itself. Okay, denga, topic, categories. Butate is the word for categories. It's often used in studies of uh, Japanese studies of Denga, the butate, okay, dai, first, this very key term that we've already discussed, dai are the set topics or topical categories used in waka and denga. These dai or stanzas in denga were classified according to these dai categories, okay? The topics used in denga are divide, uh, divide broadly into two categories, first, Okay, so the first two major dies, these are the uh, sort of umbrella dies, think of them as umbrella dies, the kinoku and the zonoku. Okay, underline these words, and I have explanations of the kinoku, or kisetsu no ki is the kanji for it, uh, seasonal verses. Okay, zonoku is the, the kanji zatsu, zonoku, the miscellaneous, or no season verses. Okay, so the kinoku has four types, obviously, because there are four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter, namely Haru, Natsu, Aki, Fuyu. Spring and autumn stanzas typically appear in threes. Okay? A max of four or five in the Edo period. Okay? But generally before the Edo period, in the medieval period, uh, typically in three. So when you have spring poems, and we'll have to confirm this when we read the uh, work for today, so we'll have to see how many, how often they appear in a sequence, in a row. Uh, spring and autumn stanzas typically appear in threes. Summer and winter stanzas, which are not so important. Remember, summer and winter are not so important and not as important in traditional Japanese aesthetics. Appear in pairs or alone. Max of three. Okay, never more than three. A series of season stanzas will often cross the boundary between one side of the writing sheet and the next. Or the transition between the sheets. Okay, so just because you're turning the page over does not mean that we have to enter a new season or a non-season. Zonoku, the miscellaneous non-season verses. Okay, just a verse that doesn't have any specific kigo, right? So, um, the more general or abstract verses, stanzas, are often uh, non-seasonal verses. So the ones that make a general point, for example, about Buddhism are often zonoku. Then, so after these two major umbrella categories, or dai, there is a third category system, uh, jibutsu. Okay, jibutsu no dai. And this has many sub-categories within it. Right? Uh, these are other topics, other lexical categories, other stanza motifs, often associated with conventional ideas about poetic essence, which we've already talked about, the hong i. I think I have a note about the hong i below. Okay, so what are these other sub-dai? These jibutsu dai. Okay, these are the major 18, I think I have here, 17 or 18, and you will want to remember all of these. Okay, and I have notes in the Hyakuin Nega that we are reading today. I give uh, these Dai categories beside each poem when they are uh, present. Okay, first is Hikarimono, luminous objects, for example, stars or glowworms, right? Uh, hikarimono. Jibun, number two, the time of day. This is divided into Yabun, things having to do with night, nocturnal things. 
Asa, morning. You, evening. Three is the sobiki mono. These are objects that rise, ascending objects, clouds, haze, mist, smoke. So whenever you see the image of Kemuri in uh, the work or Kasumi, haze, right? These are sobiki mono, and I will have written down there sobiki mono. So remember that sobiki mono means ascending objects. Furi mono. This is the opposite of sobiki mono. Things that descend, things that fall. Rain falls, snow falls, hail falls, dew falls, frost falls. Tsuyo ochiru. Yeah, in, in classical Japanese, dew is something that falls. You often see tsuyo ochiru. Uh, Sanri. Mountain related things. Anything having to do with the mountain, whenever you see a peak or a mountain and so forth, uh, that's an example of sandi. And I'll, I'll write next to the stanza sandi. Remember that sandi means mountain related things. Keep in mind that sandi categories are often, or not often, they are further divided into two further subcategories of tai and yo. Okay, so I will have, for example, sandi, the tai form, written in the uh, work when you read it. So remember what that means. I'll explain Tai and Yo at the bottom of this list. Sihen are water related things further divided into Tai and Yo. I'll explain that below. Sihen, just remember Sihen means water related things. U Ugokimono, right? Kanji for is Dobutsu, animals, but in uh, the medieval period in the context of Denga this was pronounced Ugokimono, animals divided into ju or kemono, uh, which is, means beasts, tori, birds, mushi, insects, and so forth. These are the subcategories of this subcategory. Uemono are things that uh, grow, namely plants. So anything having to do with plants, cultivation, growing things. And this includes subcategories of ki, kusa, take. So in the uh, text below, I will sometimes have ki written there, or kusa, or take, or so forth. These are all examples of uemono. Jindin, another key term that I have in several, many of the uh, stanzas below. I will just write Jindin. Uh, what does this mean? This means human relations, human life, uh, things that have to do with human morality, for example, ethics. That's all a uh, thing uh, human related. It's another category. Jingi is another category uh, of meaning shrine related or deity related. And deities, of course, kami is always a, a, a Shinto word, the way of the gods. Shinto-related uh, stanzas are classified as jingi stanzas. And I'll write jingi at the bottom. Shakyo, Buddhist-related stanzas. So anything related to Buddhist, Buddhism, any uh, Buddhist ideas of impermanence or so forth that appear in a stanza, that will make that stanza an example of the shakyo. Koi. This is one of the major fixed topics, one of the major dai of denga. Okay, it's as we pointed out above. It was uh, it had five books. The koi maki or books in the kokinshu were uh, more numerous than any of the other um, dai. It had five chapters of its own. So dai uh, koi was originally the most important of all the dai in kokinshu in classical waka, and that prominence. Uh, continues through uh, Denga, medieval Denga. The Koi Dai survived into the Haikai Denga as well. We see, we saw that in some of the Kasen of Matsu Basho and so forth. In Kasen, the love sequences typically appear as a pair of trio, a pair or trio of verses in the middle of the longer Ha or development sections. Basho tended to treat love rather freely whereas others often mirror the emotions inherit, inherited from the classics. A love sequence may follow a koi no yobi dashi verse that indirectly sets up the subject. Okay, so that's a sort of note about koi verses that appear in later kasen, but you can apply it to earlier uh, traditional denga, or hyakuin denga as well. Jukkai is another of the major dai categories. These are complaints or grievances or reminiscences. Reminisce is probably the best translation here, I think. Uh, this includes words like old days. So whenever you see mukashi, that's a hint that you uh, know that that stanza is a jukkai stanza. Okay, it's usually reflecting nostalgically. Jukkais are nostalgic reflections of past life, earlier life, right? Earlier days, earlier experiences. 
often with a, uh, the where the uh, negative or kind of sorrowful, wretched present is contrasted with a a much better past. A wretched life, hermit, hermitage uh, stanzas are often jukkai, examples of jukkai. Ones that talk about parenthood or aging are also jukkai. Tabi is the next dai. That's anything having to do with journal or travel. Nadokoro, right, written uh, kanji meisho, but in the context of denga, it translate, uh, pronounced nadokoro. Are any stanzas that have to do with famous places, historical sites, similar to the utamakura, important word that I explained above, the toponisms. Kyosho is a very important dai. We will see lots of examples of the kyosho dai in the work we're reading today. Dwellings. It literally means dwellings or residences. So whenever you see a word in a stanza, such as gates or windows or baths or gardens or so forth, you know that it's specifically referring to a kyosho or dwelling. For in the kyosho, like the si, hen, and the sanri, are further divided into these two sort of special categories of tai and yo, which I'll explain at the end of this list, essences and attributes. And finally, the isho dai, or uh, clothing dai. So whenever you see references to a sleeve or anything else, that's isho. And I will write isho next to the stanza. All right. Um, other sort of semi dai that often appear, wakare no tamujo, tensho, banka, ganauta, aisho, laments, I think I already said that. Okay. Okay, so here's the important point about the tai and the yo. Also note that sanri, si, hen, kyosho, dai, come in two types, tai and yo. Tai means, uh, is often tra translated as essences. For example, mine means peak, and umi is the sea, the ocean, are the tai, or essences, of sanri, mountains, and si, hen, water, respectively. Okay? So a mine is an essence of sandri, mountains. Umi, or ocean, is an essence of water. So an example of, a concrete example of, you might want to translate tai as, right? Yo, by contrast, expresses the attributes, or the actions of a particular thing or phenomenon. For example, taki, waterfall, are yo, or actions, attributes of si hen, water, right? Because a waterfall is something that falls, it moves. So taki is what water does. It's an action of water. Nami, a wave, is an action or attribute of water. Therefore, nami and taki fall under the yo category. Okay, moving on. We're almost at the end. More key terms. Ageku. We've already discussed this. This is, this is the final stanza of a sequence. So in a hyakuin denga, the ageku would be the final stanza 100. And the ageku should always relate back to the hokku. It usually ends with a kireji. So we'll look at, at the work that we're reading today and see if it ends with a, in a kireji. The final verse of a sequence should relate back to the hokku. I just said that. Using, okay. Hiraku. All the other verses, all the other verses after we explain the other ones, okay. Hoku is the first one, opening stanza of a denga chain, the hoku is the opening one. So stanza one is the hoku, it's the forebear of modern term haiku, so haiku comes from hoku, as I've mentioned many times already, uh, abbreviation of haiku no ku, started by Masuzu. Sets the stage. The hoku is the only truly independent or self contained poem stanza in the entire sequence. Often ends with a full stop kiriji such as kana. In traditional denga, it must include kigo and kiriji. Basis for modern haiku. Hoku, in hoku increasingly haiku like in the Edo period. Okay, the second stanza of the 100 verse sequence in our case here is the wakiku. The second verse of the Denga chain, 7-7, seven, seven, syllabic pattern. The host writes it. Okay, so the host of the occasion writes it. It complements the hokka, brings a slight shift, making explicit what is implicit in the opening hokka. Should not shift the time of season. So whatever season is set in the hokka, 
uh, usually continues through the Hawakika. You shouldn't suddenly change it there. Often compared to a host who receives the main guest, the Hokka, and responds to him accordingly. Often ends with a noun. Daisan no ku is the third ku or stanza of the Denga chain, 575. Must end in Renyoke. The Renyoke is the te form of a verb to allow the next poet greater freedom in creating the stanza. It brings a change. Okay, so the, the uh, wakiku conformed to the original hoku. This one, however, the daisan no ku, brings a change. It introduces a new scene, new image, new context. Should be distantly related, or soku, to the second verse. It shouldn't be too close to the second verse. It should never have anything to do with the first one. Right? So you always forget the preceding, preceding verse. The hoku, which is supposed to disappear the moment it is written, Reversal, circularity, stops, returns, circular movements, violate the principle, the essence of the idea of flow, the yukiyo, right, which is ex essential to denga. Denga should always flow onward. Instead, being based on the principle of continuous flow, moving forward is essential. All right. So, okay, to review, stanza one is the hokka, stanza two, wakika, stanza three is the uh, daisanoka. And then the very last one is the ageku. All others are called the hiraku, which I have included in the list above. Uchikoshi, we've already mentioned this above. This is the first before the maiku. Okay, so uh, take any random stanza, say stanza 13. Uh, the one before 13 is the maiku, stanza 12. The one before that is stanza 11, and this is the uchikoshi. And this is the one that is supposed to disappear the moment the tsukiku is composed. Tsukeku is the following verse, sometimes called the shimoku, more or less synonymous, I think. Following verse in a two-verse sequence, any added verse must be based on the preceding one and must respond to it harmoniously, but at the same time the scene cannot stay at the same spot where the first poem started. The wakiku or the tsukeku must, at, must move forward to gain a new perspective and a new context, as it were. Something similar to the experience of looking at an emaki scroll painting. Okay, when you look at an emaki scroll painting, the scene of the story develops, and we move forward along with the development, so that once you get to a certain point, you've already forgotten what happened on the previous page and so forth. Taken together, the maiku and the tsukiku, two verses, should make one harmonious world. Two successive verses make up a picture, a poem with thematic and emotional unity, while the third verse brings a change or a shift from the previous picture, making up a new picture with the immediately preceding verse. Okay, stuff we've already talked about is just a kind of review explanation. Kireji, we've already talked about this. These are cutting words that give structural support to a stanza, dividing the particular and the whole. When at the end of the stanza, it provides closure, drawing the reader back to the beginning, initiating a circular pattern. When in the middle, it serves as a pause that cuts the verse into two independent thoughts, giving emotional emphasis to preceding words. There are 18 standard kireji, ka and ya, which cut or join the stanza into two. Kana or gana, usually at the end, indicates kind of wonder, exclamation of wonder. Mogana, zo, ka, ya, yo, and then several other I have on this list. You can review those for yourself. Kaishi is the name of the fancy paper. We've already talked about that. That is uh, used in Kasen. I think it's used in Denga as well, but I have to check. Um, Johaku is the uh, rhythmical pattern that is found in much of traditional Japanese um, drama, poetry, music, and so forth. Johaku, introduction, slow development, fast conclusion. Sometimes translated as andante, allegro. Cristo, to use Western terminology, original music, originally a musical dance pattern, a principle on which most Japanese music and no drama was based, a slow measured beginning followed by increasing tempo and intensity, and then a fast and furious conclusion. This rhythmic principle governs the denga sequence composition. So we'll find this in the hundred verses that we're reading now. Jo ha kyu. Okay, so in your paper you can mark off when the where the Joe begins, where it ends, where the ha begins and ends, and where the Q and begins and ends. The Joe preface should be moderate in tone, dignified and graceful in style. 
emphasizing the beauty of you again, the uh, mysterious depth that we talked about above. The middle hop development should be more varied, ingenious, and eventful. The final cue should be light, swift, and not too elaborate. Okay. So in Kasen, which we've already read, a uh, later form of uh, Denga, the Haikai Denga form called the Kasen, we saw the following. We saw Jo appeared in verses or stanzas 1 to 6. Ha appeared in stanzas 7 to 18 and 19 to 30. So the Ha was divided into two sections we saw there. And then the Q, 31 to 36. Hong Yi is the next term on your list. Hong Yi or Chinese Bang Yi. True essences, conventional meanings, essential characters, characteristics, poetic essences, conventional meanings of things. An aesthetic principle, especially in Denga, conventionally entailing the character of certain things, codified versions of essential nature. It's important to keep in mind that Hong Yi are not the thing as it is, right? So the Hong Yi of a of love, for example, is not the love not love as it actually is objectively. Or the Hong Yi of the moon is not the thing as it actually is but rather the thing as it has been conventionally interpreted and represented by previous poets and artists. Okay, so this is very different from Western realism. You don't convey the thing as it is objectively as you do in Western realism. Rather, in traditional Japanese poetry, in traditional Japanese art, you convey the hongi, or the conventional or poetic essence of the thing. For example, love, koi, uh, is the hong yi, the hong yi of love or koi is unrequited longing in in a lot of cases not always but in most cases in many cases unless the lovers sometime actually meet then you have ao koi travel the hong yi of travel is uh, suffering right it's nostalgia travel in some direction other than to the capital you're moving away from the capital into the barbaric or the provinces the less cultivated less sophisticated regions of the world. So that necessarily uh, entails some sort of nostalgia or sorrow at leaving civilization. Flowers, hana. And spring rain, moon, and so forth. I give, uh, you can read all those examples by yourself. So in reality, the th- these things, these phenomena, may be otherwise, but the codified versions of them were considered especially poetic. Okay, and where do these hong yi meanings <coughs> originate? The essential versions of things often derive from ancient Shinto beliefs, so many of them come from the Shinto native Japanese religion. Others come from uh, annual observances of court, many with uh, Chinese origins, and, uh, origins in Chinese ideas and Chinese in principles and Chinese poetry too is another source of these Hong Yi origins. And in Denga, Denga linked verse codified these essential characteristics, passed them on to no drama and Haikai Denga in other literary forms. Okay, moving on. Next term, So Sho is the master of the Denga group, the master of the session. The So Sho is the most experienced of the gathered Denju. Denju is another important term. Denju is simply the uh, participants of the Denga session. The poets who have gathered to uh, compose their stanzas are the Denju. The So Sho is the most experienced and the most, usually the most talented of these Denju. Also called the Sabaki. So Sho can also be called the Sabaki. And what is the sabis, uh, Sabaki's role, So Sho's role? is to write the opening hokka, to guide the others, to edit the entire sequence once it's finished or as it's, and as it's taking place, make sure that everyone follows the shikimoka rules and conventions, uh, co- coordinates the ichiza, the, the uh, seating, one seating, and is responsible for the completion of the renga. And the sosho or sabaki also has the authority to dismiss or throw away an improper verse. So if somebody writes something that doesn't conform to the rules enough, or that simply uh, the social did not take a liking to, he or she can throw that away. Jiamari is when you see uh, too many syllables in a line of waka or denga, 
So, for example, in a 575 syllable stanza, if somebody writes one with 585, that's called Ji Amari Uta Awase are the poetry contests or the waka matches, distinctive feature of Japanese literature in the classical period, the origin of group composition and practices and denga linked verse. So, uh, the idea of people gathering and composing verse together collaboratively uh, comes from this uh, tradition or custom of the utawase poetry contests. Nenga um, emerges from that. Shuhitsu is the brush keeper. Generally does not compose the verses but sits there, is present at the session. And the Shuhitsu's main task is to keep a record and to remind the participants about the rules the very complicated rules that they might forget at certain times. Okay, so that's an important point to keep in mind that uh, uh, just as we struggle to remember all of these rules, so too the uh, participants themselves would often have trouble remembering all the complicated rules. And when they would forget one, the Shuhitsu would come along and remind them of the rules. And the Shuhitsu notices any violations. And so forth. You know, yeah. So without the shuhitsu, the poets would have to worry about these rules and keeping track of all of them, and they wouldn't be able to focus on composing the an interesting or um, a, a, what's the word I'm looking for a skilled or distinguished stanza. Uh, and the last term here is yuki yo, which I've already mentioned briefly. This is a very very important term in the context of denga. Yuki yo, the flow. Okay, the way of the the mode in which it goes, the way in which something proceeds, is the literal translation of the kanji yuku, iku, and zama, the flow, the movement of the sequence as a whole. The yukiyo of a denga sequence is created by the patterns of links and the shifting of the verses, as distinct to individual linked pairs. Okay, so the yukiyo is the whole, the flow of the entire thing. Okay, moving on now to the links. The I've already said the links is translated. The original is kakari, but it's also tsuke, tsukeai, tsukeai, tsuke, and kakari are the words that are often translated into English as links. Uh, so let's discuss the various types of links here. Tsukeai. First, the definition of tsukeai uh, relation between the verses. The links can be via words, via content, via expressions via resonances, and so forth. So there are many ways to link a stanza to the preceding one. The Haikai Denga poet Matsuo Basho identified three main kinds of verse connections, three main kinds of skei. Alright. Note that all links can be classified as either shinku or soku. So these are the two sort of major general concepts or categories that... Uh, Earl Miner wrote a lot about these and made a big fuss about these two words, shinku and soku, but later scholars of, more recent scholars of Nenga have uh, sort of de-emphasized these and said they're not as important, but we should nevertheless uh, be aware of these two words because there are two categories for, uh, category, two general ter- uh, concepts for categorizing um, the stanzas and the relation between the stanzas. Shinku are the ones that are closely related. So if I write something that is very near the previous verse, the connection is obvious, then that's an example of a shinku, a closely related link, or a closely related verse. Soku is the opposite, the remotely related links. So if somebody writes a tsukeku to a maiku, and you have to take about 10 minutes to finally find how that is related to the previous verse, that's an example of soku. Those are two general categories for... um, considering these links, but the more specific categories that Matsu Basho and others have come up with and that are often used in discussions of Renga are the following. First, Matsu Basho's three famous categories that he came up with, Kotoba Zuke, the word links, in which Engo, associative words, are very important. Yoriai, lexical connections, are very important here in Kotoba Zuke. Straightforward method of linguistic linking is important here. So kotoba are fairly straightforward. They're, most of them, I think, you could safely say, qualify as shinku, or closely related links. Kokoro zuke are the content links. Kokoro is, uh, uh, can be translated in this context as content, rather than simply heart. Content links, linking through narrative, through cause and effect, 
through uh, similarities of scene or using the same scene again. Those are Kokorozuke content links. And the third category that Matsuo Basho came up with that he uh, preferred, he said this is the most refined, sophisticated, and difficult of the three types of zuge, or is Nioi zuge, also sometimes called Yosei zuge. Right? Yosei is written Yojo, Yosei. Uh, these are the scent links, literally scent links. These are montage-like, very subtle, very indirect, very associative, uh, sometimes thematically related, but uh, not obviously so. Connotative, atmospheric, non-contiguous, non-parallel, feeling-based yoin, or polit uh, poetical overtones that resonate with the previous verse. Okay, so yose, I said, Nioizuke is also known as Yoseizuke. Yosei means poetical overtones, resonances. Okay. Uh, linking by fragrance allows for a separation of scenes. Okay, so in the maiku, the poet before me might have uh, created a certain scene, and I can, in my skeku, I can uh, write my skeku in a completely different scene and link my stanza to the previous stanza, not through a setting or scene, but through this sort of more nebulous or vague concept of fragrance or poetical overtones. This was preferred by Basho, as I mentioned, linking by lingering resonances, overtones, suggestiveness, and so forth. Okay. Moving on, other types of links include the following. Could I do get, which are rank links, Linking by revealing the social rank or station of a of a person who appears in the link. Seiryo zuke, these are guessing links. Linking by surmise. Omokage zuke, uh, linking by suggestion, suggested allusion to a precursor poem or text. Omokage zuke, you might translate this as sort of intertextual or allusive, referential linking. Omokage zuke. Imi zuke, meaning linking. This is probably the same thing as kokoro zuke. Uh, Matsu Basho discussed as one of the three major forms. Monozuke, object linking. Okay, so those are the main forms of zuke. There are probably some others that we're missing, but uh, that should give you an idea of some of the categories. And keep in mind that you can create new categories. You can find or clarify uh, links using sort of modern rationality or modern intelligence in a way that uh, the medieval poets were unable to do. Next two terms are the hana no joza and the tsuki no joza, which we've already discussed. In the context of kaseng, these are called the hana no za. Before kaseng, in the medieval uh, denga period, they were called hana no joza. This is the place or seat of a blossom. The fixed topics of, of spring blossoms, remember spring blossoms in the context of poetry is always either cherry or plum blossoms. The hana no joza usually appear twice, okay, the description I have here is in reference to Kasen. Um, so I'm not going to review all that. So in the work that we're reading today, find all the instances of Hana no Joza, I think was one of the questions on your study guide. Find all the Hana no Joza. Do they conform to the usual rules? Okay. Um, Tsuki no Joza is the next one. This is the place or the seat of the moon image. All right, and then I have a description in relation to the kasen. I don't have one for the other thing. Okay, so I'm not sure exactly where the tsuki no joza and where the hana no joza are supposed to appear in Hyakuin 100 stanza denga sequence. We can look that up and uh, find out whether this work that we're reading today, the minase uh, sangin hyakuin, conforms to the standard shikimoku regarding these two uh, types of images. Alright, that's the end of this. And then on video one, which I've already uploaded, I do a reading of the entire work in Japanese and the English translation, along with an explanation of the study questions that you are required to answer for your assignment. Okay, so if you've already watched video one, watch this one uh, now, but if you have not watched either, uh, ideally um, it would be best to watch this video first, and I'll make a note of that in the description to this video. So you guys, okay, this is an extremely long 
video, but we finally reached the end of it, and uh, some of these notes are still very rough. Um, I just compiled them and have yet to edit them, so I apologize for any roughness that you might have seen in this uh, long video, but uh, that's what you, we don't have the time to redo the whole thing, so this is what you get. Goodbye for now, send me uh, an email if you have any questions.